Thanks, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Um, great to see everybody here in person in Melbourne. Um, before we kick things off, just we're running a little bit behind schedule, so we might keep any questions to the end of the session. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our panel um, this morning. As Rachel said, we've got Tulin, um, who's a third-party risk management expert at UpGuard. Uh, we have Agnes Tauk, who's a cybersecurity expert at um, Cable and Brown, and will give us some particular insights on um, crypto um, brokerage. And Gilbert Joseph, who's a cybersecurity consultant at Palo Alto. Um, well, as, as Rachel said, it's been quite a year for cybersecurity. Our news feeds are full of um, news about um, nation-sponsored attacks, the, rising, um, the rise of ransomware globally and the effect that that has on organisations, and then increased regulator scrutiny just to top it off um, and a tightening cyber insurance market. Um, so we thought to set the scene for our conversation today, we'd have our panel um, just give us a bit of a, an insight into the current cyber threat landscape um, and why we need to understand this in order to have our cybersecurity risk management program in place. Gilbert, maybe we could start sure. with you. Sure, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I th so I think it's really critical for organisations these days to understand the cyber risk that they may be vulnerable to uh, and use that awareness and that information to feed back into the organisation to shape and also form the broader cybersecurity strategy. Um, we live in a time of uh, unprecedented cyber attacks, not only from the volumes of attacks that we're seeing, but also from the level of sophistications of threats. And as a result, we've seen you know, uh, an, an exponential increase in terms of cyber breaches over the last few years. The, the motivation behind some of those attacks would vary from an inexperienced hacker trying to extort uh, personal information from a credit card that was purchased on the dark web, to a well-organized state-sponsored threat group that's aiming to destabilize the global financial market to further their political agenda. So, and the, I guess the other thing to think about is the adversary themselves aren't always people. It's sometimes bots or machines that have been spun up to launch, uh, launch an attack. So from a FinTech perspective, it's key to understand the cyber threat landscape. And as organizations continue to, to innovate, um, they need to be mindful of some of those um, threats that they could be up against so that they can safeguard the organisation. Um, Agnes, I'd be keen to hear from you just to building on, um, build on what Gilbert said. From your perspective, um, for a crypto, from a crypto company's perspective, what are the particular threats that you're seeing? Yeah, well, um, it's not really different than any other organisation that we would see, but the only difference that I have noticed is mainly their goal which is financial profit. And this is why the FinTech and especially crypto because it's new and it's emerging and you know, there hasn't been much security built there for everything that's new. You don't start off with security a lot of times. So that's where they find a weakness that, oh, we don't have a lot of people working on security in crypto. So let's go and take advantage of that. And at the end of the day, their goal is financial profit, which, which makes it really um, a very targeted and you know, a good space to be trying to cause any damage in. Um, and yeah, just like any other company, same risks like phishing, employees being attacked, um, that kind of stuff is really kind of the same. It's just, yeah, they just take advantage of that weakness that, you know, a new space has. Yeah, and I think, um, Chul and we were talking about to um, almost getting inside the mind of these threat actors to the extent that you can, yeah. to the extent that they're people. Um, and, and why is that important and what role would intelligence play in that? Yeah, of course. So I think intelligence plays a huge role. So being able to put yourself in that mind frame of how, you know, your, your hackers and your attackers might, you know, come in and, and make the most of your vulnerabilities. So, you know, every company has cyber risk. You know, it's, you're never going to be able to not have cyber risk. We're not going to be able to eliminate it. But what you can do is reduce the impact of those attacks and also reduce your risk of 
of, of, of those cyber attacks, right? So, and, and how you would do that is by understanding and knowing what's around you, understanding your threat actors, you know, looking at who are the types of threat actors that would target your organisation? How would they potentially do it? You know, having those workshops and talking to multiple people in your company, because I can guarantee that there's probably some people in your company who might know more about this than you, um, and who might even have some experience around what the threat actors may be. So it's always important to, to speak to various people in your organisation. Um, you know, I think another another key aspect is thinking about you know your your supplier chain risk, your, your third parties. So I know a lot of fintechs like startups will use you know Google's and AWS and potentially other smaller startups as well for things like document management or even contract management and things like that. So looking at those companies and seeing what type of data are you sharing with them. You know, thinking about, okay, is that within our risk appetite? Is it okay they have access to that? When do they have access to that? What are they doing with it? Where is it stored? So thinking about all of those things as well, which then that will also open up your threat landscape, right, and your actors as well. So, um, you know, thinking about those things and, and taking that into consideration, you'll reduce your cyber risk um, exponentially, I think. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, isn't it? That you your cyber security strategy needs to be a holistic one. Yes. It's not just buy a piece of technology or buy a particular service and, and you're done. Um, maybe, again, we were talking about this this morning, maybe you could um, tell us a bit more about what an, a holistic cyber security plan or strategy would look like. Yeah, sure. Um, I guess we need to be mindful of that from a cyber security perspective, it's a combination of three key elements. It's people, processes and technology. Um, it's not about just a piece of hardware or a piece of software that's um, going to um, mitigate the threats within the environment, but it's also the processes and the, and the people behind that that's going to drive the adoption of that technology. If we look at the fintech industry um, more specifically over the last few years, in 2021, for example, the biggest ransom that was paid was in excess of $40 million. Right? From a fintech perspective, the average... Um, in initial demand from a re from a ransomware perspective is in excess of 7.6 million dollars and that's quite damaging for most organizations right being able to recover from such an incident could be devastating and long lasting um, so I think it's ensuring that we've got an intimate knowledge of that landscape and then ensuring that we can have the right processes and controls in place um, to drive the adoption of the technology to mitigate the risk yeah, and I, and I think um, the regulators are certainly making it clear that um, investing in cyber security is no, not an optional um, an optional choice. Um, but obviously, you know, particularly for startups and, and growth companies um, where budgets might be tight and you're looking to invest in your IT and information security, what tips would you have or, or how do you go about, I guess, you know, selling internally the value of both investing and, and also the risk and, and the cost that could come of, of not investing? So I think there's a few things to think about here. It's easy to quantify the expense, the expense when it comes to um, purchasing the right level of controls or the right capabilities to mitigate certain risk. But we're often unable to quantify how much is it going to cost to the organisation if we don't do something about it? This, you know, leaving it to the status quo, it's certainly not a viable option. So it's ensuring then that we are approaching the, um, I guess, the day-to-day -day operations with a different mindset. Um, if we think about the fintech um, industry, it's very much what Uber did for the transportation or what Airbnb did for hospitality. Um, the, the fintech industry is always all around innovation, agility, and speed. So with that, with respect to providing services for its customers, fintech organizations need to then approach that service with a security um, by design. Uh, we talk about the concept of zero trust, for example. Um, zero trust is a concept, it's a methodology that's been around for a number of years, and it's based on the premise that trust itself is a vulnerability that always gets exploited by the adversary. Um, so there's no such thing as implicit trust within the organisation. So as you're dealing with third-party um, lenders, providers, service providers, um, you need to be mindful of that digital interaction between your organisation and the third-party organisation. We talked about TPRM earlier on from a uh, third-party risk management perspective. It's incorporating all those different elements into your day-to-day -day digital interaction so that you can secure the 
you know, the information effectively, whether that's on-prem or in the cloud. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you, Gilbert. And I think you raise a good point there around, you know, protecting the, the data and protecting who has access to it, whether it's digitally, physically, you know, however it might be for you on the cloud or on-prem. You know, I think it's important for a lot of companies and especially when you are a startup and you're a smaller company, you can kind of take control of your data, right? You can think about what, you know, your crown jewels are, which we spoke about uh, last week when we got together. You know, thinking about what is the most important asset to you in your company. So what is the most important data that you have? What is so valuable to you that if that was going to be um, taken advantage of or if it was leaked out of your organisation, how would that impact your company from a financial impact perspective, reputational impact perspective? You know, would you lose customers? Would you lose money? So, you know, going that step back and actually looking at what are our crown jewels? What are we doing to protect those? Who has access to it? Where is it located? You know, thinking about all of those things can actually take you back that one step. And if you start doing that now, really early on, you'll, you know, set yourself up for success when it comes to, you know, when you, when you grow and you're getting larger and you'll have, you know, more control over those jewels and understanding like, okay, what data is important now? Because that will change over the years as you get bigger. And, you know, going back to, you know, the regulators in, in the financial industry, like they will love that. They will love that for you, trust me. APRA will be all over your ass. Like, we love that. Like, they, they harp on about, you know, protecting your crown jewels, looking at your data, taking that step back. Who has access to it? How are you controlling it? You know, they love that so much. So a lot of our APRA-regulated customers kind of started struggling with thinking that way, especially when, you know, some of the new Prudential standards came out. So if you, if you think about that, you're going to set yourself up for success. And that's a good point, Jillian, because... From a cyber risk perspective, it's not always protecting yourself from existing risk that we already know of. Right? So as the organisation is expanding, I mean, at this point in time, the last time I saw some of the data, um, there's over 30% of fintech Australian companies who have already expanded their operations uh, abroad. So it's understanding, you know, what, that, what does that global landscape actually look like? And also from an innovation standpoint, being able to then understand that as the, as the organisation themselves um, grows its operation, it's been able to protect yourself against the unknown threats that we don't know about yet. And that's leveraging the right technology and the right data. Yep. We talked about the role of intelligence before. Being able to leverage that information to give you insights as to what the attacker may be doing already inside your network. Yeah. I, can, I can definitely confirm on that from a startup point of view because I started at Caleb and Brown and it was just not really a mature kind of a startup. Um, and they tend, like all startups, tend to focus on growth and exposure and, you know, just getting new customers and getting revenue before even thinking of security. And it's more like a, something that we can achieve later on. But the more you get exposure, the more you get risk, the more you get threat. So building that, so being ready for that is more important than, you know, just going in there and just start growing and getting customers and being all over the place without really knowing what your threats are and, and not just understanding what your what is valuable for you, you need to understand what is valuable for a hacker. What are what do they want from me? What would they try to, you know, how would they try to damage or affect me in any way? And coming from an ethical hacking hacking background, so I used to work more of an offensive security. I never cared about, you know, what proactive measures I need to do. I just need I cared about like, oh, how can I attack this company? This kind of mindset, you know, being in the shoes of a hacker kind of helps you understand where your biggest risks are and not just from an insider point of view, more of an outsider point of view. You know how they say, to know your enemy, you need to become your enemy? Yeah, you need to really, you need to really understand what do they want? How will they try to attack me? What's my weakest point in their point of view? And start working on that early on. Yeah, great advice. It's um, you know always easier to build it from the ground up, isn't it, rather than yeah. trying to bolt on whether it's privacy by design or safety by design or security, um, easier to do it from the beginning. And, and I'd be interested in the panel's view on, you know, not just from a cybersecurity perspective, um, but also from a reputational perspective and, and keeping customers engaged and, and, and investors, if, you, if that's what you're doing. Um, you know, how can we promote that cybersecurity culture within our organisations? 
Yeah, so I could take this one on. Uh, so I think to be able to promote it internally is obviously, you know, doing the awareness training, you know, talking to your, your staff, your team, you know, educating them on, on what it is, what it means, because, you know, you'd be surprised in so many organisations, large and small and, and mid-sized, like a lot of them don't actually know what cyber risk is. They don't know, you know, something that they might be doing every day, maybe opening up a risk for the whole company, right? And, you know, if you think about it, a lot of our data breaches, uh, most of them do occur from your front line of defence, which are your people who might be sending emails out, receiving things, opening attachments, like thinking about that kind of thing, you know, like phishing and spear phishing, like they are some of the easiest targets um, for, for the attackers and they just need one point of entry, one small point of entry and they'll sit in your system from months, sometimes up to a year, depending exactly what they want from you, until they can make a more targeted attack and get access to things and then pull the data out. So, you know, I think it's so important to educate your, your team, educate your organisation on, you know, not only cyber risk in general, you know, you can also target it from a personal perspective too, because I think when people start applying that knowledge to their personal life, they'll also do it in their work life too. So. You know, I, I've kind of taken that on with a lot of, you know, the different customers I've worked with in the past and it helps a lot and some of them after the workshops would come up and be like, oh, I, I use this app, like, what should I be doing? You know, do you think I should use it? How can I protect myself? And then how can I do that internally? Like, we see that a lot with a lot of the insurance customers too where they're dealing with lots of files coming in and out of the company. So, you know, I think you really need to just go down to the basics with them talk to them, tell them, give them examples, do exercises and, you know, do it regularly. Don't just do it once off to tick the box exercise for compliance or whatever it might be. Um, you want to be doing it regularly and stay on top of it because your threat actors, your threat landscape is going to be changing almost daily. And that's a good point. So with respect to the threat actors, I mean, there was a saying going around the last couple of years during the pandemic is uh, never waste a good crisis, right? The threat actors are working 24-7. So from a mitigation standpoint, we need to ensure that we've got the right measures in place, the right capabilities and controls in place to mitigate those risks, right? And it's constantly evolving. The threat actor is always looking for innovative ways to bypass your traditional security defences. So from a mitigation standpoint, we also need to leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning and all the innovative ideas to be able to counteract some of those measures that I put in place. Yeah. And one thing I've learned is the more secure you are, the more hackers are going to try to get creative and find other ways. So you will never reach a point where you're secure and you can just sleep like a baby at night. That doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, because so th the more you, the better you become at security, the better hackers are becoming. So as Tulin was saying, raising awareness for employees, you know, making sure everything is going right internally is really important. But also hackers can, you know, can find new ways and you should always be prepared for that. Like they can do it through your clients, for example, because clients, you don't really have control over them. You can't really train your clients and they can do that. So you really need to also think, okay, what if my client does get affected? I need to make sure I have the right measures in place. It's not just me, it's their security as well. I need to kind of take care of them, make sure that whatever service I'm providing for them does not get affected by them getting hacked. So it's like, yeah, you need to think of all kind of like scenarios and that's where it gets like kind of, you know, intense, <laughs> I would say. Not to scare everybody in the room <laughs> uh, too much. Uh, but I think that leads on to sort of the final point that we wanted to cover off and, and hopefully leave with some practical tips today in terms of, you know, Cyber security is not perfect. You will never guarantee that you won't have a cyber attack. And in fact, the topic of the conversation is the inevitable cyber attack. Um, so I'd like to um, invite the panel to talk about um, if, well, really, when the inevitable does occur, how do we best respond, leaving aside, um, you know, where I would get involved in terms of a reporting and, and legal perspective, but how do we respond in this, what is a crisis, um, and, and respond in a way that means we can can recover? That's a great point. So from a response perspective, and it goes back, I think, to the people and processes uh, conversation that we had earlier on, um, being able to, number one is to be aware of the threat actors within the environment, uh, or at least the potential uh, damage that it could do to the environment. So this is from a cyber readiness perspective. But after the breach, it's all around compromise assessment risk assessment, maybe looking at your security operations or your day-to-day -day operations or your B2B 
um, transactions, how the data itself is flowing throughout the environment and being able to really isolate and go back to the very uh, first instant where the breach itself took place within the, the organization. Once you've got a, a detail or a thorough understanding of when the threat actually took place, you can then have the right measures in place to restore in the information. Yeah, and this is really important, you know, understanding what, where you went wrong and fixing it and, you know, making sure you're back on track, recovering your backups and everything. But I also see this as like the easy part of a cyber attack. Like this is something you can't control. The hard part would be regaining your customer's trust. They do understand that everyone gets hacked, but then they're going to become doubtful. Oh, do I really want to continue with that company? So here comes the biggest challenge and how do I regain my customer's uh, trust? And that would be basically just really showing them that we are working on fixing everything and we take security very seriously. And that can only be done by you know, having security processes in place and having um, policies in place and you know, being compliant and all of that and really communicating with their clients truthfully what the problem was and how we're fixing it and how, what we're doing to get back on track. Yeah, I think you guys raised some great points there. And just, just to add to it, I think, you know, looking at the incident, it's also always a good idea to have some sort of cyber insurance in place. So, you know, obviously, depending on the type of data you're dealing with, how much data, and, and I guess how many people you have in your organisation who would be able to take control of a crisis, because essentially you're managing a crisis at this point once an attack happens you know, who's looking after comms to the customers? How are you going to relay this to them? At what point are you going to relay it to them? How are you going to be writing these letters or emails or is it phone calls, you know? And that's where your cyber insurer, depending on, on what you're covered for and what level you're covered for, can definitely help you with that. So they usually have teams of people who can help you with writing up comms. They can have lawyers, um, you know, like Sophie, who can help you making sure that you're choosing the right vocabulary and you're not digging yourself into a deeper hole. Um, you know, you've got to make sure you stay on top of obviously isolating your environment then you have forensics as well which is a separate whole thing so you know depending who you're also governed by so you know you've got in Australia the OAIC um, where you have to report certain data breaches that happen so who's doing that who's looking after that comms you know so there is a whole lot that comes into play when you're thinking about crisis management so I think you know <coughs> dealing with it once that happens is one thing where your cyber insurer can help you or if you've got a lawyer um, who actually specialises in that. Um, otherwise, you know, prepping yourself is so important, like having a crisis management plan, you know, having a business continuity plan because it's not just about, okay, what happens? If you isolate your environment, then, you know, doing your forensics on that data and then how are you going to bring yourself back up, which was what Gilbert was saying, you know, how are you going to do that? Is that in a phased you know, is that in a phased kind of um, timeline or are you doing it all at once? Have you tested it before? Do you even know if it's going to work? So, like, a lot of these questions, like, organisations do struggle with and, you know, that's where the testing and doing that regularly, you know, at least annually or twice a year um, is very important. Um, and that will help you become more comfortable with dealing with the crisis once it happens. But another thing that I think companies also forget about is, you know, what about your physical assets, you know, protecting yourself physically, you know, thinking about like, you know, have you looked at are your doors closing properly? Have you got people that can just walk into your office, you know? Are you leaving laptops unlocked on the desk so that people can just see what you're working on? You know, are you walking away from your desk, leaving your computer unlocked? So things like that, you know, if you're printing stuff out, are you just leaving it at a printer? Are you working in a co-working space? How are you protecting your data there? So, you know, thinking about all of that will also help you with preparing and being ready for when you need to jump into a crisis management mode. Sorry, I feel like that was a lot. That was excellent. <laughs> that was excellent. Uh, you know, preparation really is key, right? And, and it's not just having, you know, sometimes I work with clients who have a data breach response plan, but they've never actually, you know, had a, a, a tabletop exercise to see, well, you know, if we need to be contacting these people, do we have their mobile phone numbers? You know, how do we mobilise people um, in order to respond? Um, and you're right, it's not just, you know, the containment is, is key, but also how do we keep running our business when we're trying to investigate what's happening and if we've still got these vulnerabilities and we're rolling back um, to, to a, a, you know, a, a series of, of, of processes or technology that actually also has another vulnerability and have we, you know, are we just perpetuating the issue? Um, I think, I can't see Rachel, but we might have time for 
questions if there's anyone who has any. There's a mic coming. Thank you very much. Really informative. Um, if, if cyber is traditionally regarded as an enterprise game, which I find it is, and SMEs and, and startups that are unsophisticated, don't have the budgets for cyber insurance and are trying to go it alone, um, MSPs aren't all equal, obviously. And how can a SME or a startup be confident in who they appoint as their MSP? Because obviously you're outsourcing a lot of that risk and, and, and requirements. Is there you know, the, the essential eight doesn't quite go into that depth. It goes very, you know, basically. Is there ways in which we can advise or is there resources, affordable resources without consultants that can help a business feel confident in the, perhaps the MSP that they identify? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, look, there are a lot of providers out there who uh, have the ability to give that level of um, consulting to a lot of the SMEs. Uh, the, the misconception from a threat landscape perspective is that it's always the enterprise that's being attacked. But well, we know that the data shows, tells us that 71% of ransomware is actually targeted at small businesses, right? So then how do you ensure that your small business is being protected as best as possible? Um, and unfortunately, it's often comes down, we talked about this this morning, to a dollar conversation, right? Because there's only so much money you've got available, but it's understanding, I guess, the, the crown jewels you know, where does the data actually live, whether it's on-prem or in cloud, and then having the right level of control. So choosing the right partner that's got uh, an industry experience and knowledge around the threat landscape to be able to then help you navigate through those day-to-day -day challenges. Any other questions or? Sorry, I'm blinded by the lights, I can't see. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Rhys James from PSC, we're insurance brokers for fintechs. And one of the topics that's being discussed in the insurance market at the moment is the, um, the exclusion of state-based actors and the appropriateness of those exclusions. Could you give us any insight into where the threat actors actually are, both geographically, how much of them, how many are in Australia versus perhaps overseas, and perhaps the type of threat actors that you refer to, whether they are state-based attacks or they're commercial enterprises? Yeah, sure, I can shed some light on that. So uh, at this point in time, we know that there are in excess of 3,000 organized crime syndicates out there from a threat landscape perspective. So these are threat groups, threat groups who are funded, state funded, to be able to launch an attack. 60% um, of those attacks do actually originate from the United States. Right. And then you have a certain percentage throughout the Asia Pacific region, throughout APAC. And as far as Australia is concerned, it's only 1.2% of those attackers who are actually based in Australia, launching an attack from Australia. Having said that, though, it is a global um, threat landscape. It doesn't really matter whether you're in Australia, you're in Hobart, or you're in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, the threat is very real. So it's something to keep, kind of keep mindful of. But with respect to the threat actors, and it's, they're constantly evolving. Uh, there are lots of organisations out there who monitor the activities of those um, threat, um, the, the threat actors and the types of activities that they actually uh, carry out. Um, so that's just the, I guess, the top end of those threat actors. You also have now um, other hackers who are perhaps inexperienced because ransomware, for example, and I keep picking on ransomware, it's become very commoditised. Um, you have a credit card that you've purchased on the dark web that gives you access to a whole bunch of different tools to launch an attack on any organisation. Right, so, uh, th and there's, there's certainly a lot more, uh, you know, of those threats that are out there in the wild that we're certainly not aware of. Thank you. I think we've probably run out of time today. Um, thanks so much for joining us and, um, and thanks to our panel. We'll, we will be around for a little bit longer if you've got any burning cybersecurity questions. Make use of our wonderful experts here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.